Hello, everybody. Welcome to podcast number three of This Week in Innovation. I'm Jeff Roster, former Gartner and IHL retail sector analyst, now serving on several advisory boards, and now recently just joined the uh, new Retail Innovation Center at George Mason University, and really, really looking forward to that. I'm here with my host, Brian Sethanation, um, CEO of Iterate.ai. Today's subject matter is social commerce, and we have two very special guests to help us unpack what that means for not only their business, which is direct to consumer, but also the impacts on retail holistically. And that is Shiv Dutt, uh, VP Customer Experience and Innovation at Pamper Chef, and uh, his his partner doing an awful lot of uh, interesting work, Jake Pose, co-founder and CEO of Jump Rope. Today's audio comes from a, a recent clubhouse room we did on this very subject. So why don't we give a listen? And I'm also very happy to hear with me to have two additional guest speakers. The first person, Shiv, Shiv, Shiv is a vice president at Pamper Chef. And Shiv, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then you can then you can go ahead and introduce, and then Jake, you can introduce Jake as well. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for having me on, Brian. I'm as you mentioned, uh, Shiv Dad. I'm uh, Vice President of uh, Customer Experience and Innovation at Pampered Chef. For those of you who don't know, Pampered Chef is a is a, a direct selling company that's been around for over forty years, and in in a interesting way has been in the social commerce space the entire time. And uh, we're really looking at social commerce as the next uh, frontier, if you will, for our business model. And uh, I'm really excited to be working with Brian on trying to figure out how to digitize our business and, you know, as well as with Jake. And we're looking at interesting ways of uh, solving uh, a problem, I think, that all of many people are dealing with around this space. So I'm uh, excited to be here. And I'll try to hand it over to Jake. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. So I'm I'm Jake. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of a company called Jump Rope. We're a consumer platform for sort of anyone to learn how to do anything. So recipe, craft project, beauty tutorial, travel guide, and we empower sort of creators from their kitchens, living rooms, bathrooms, gyms, garages to create sort of amazing step by step guides that are both informative and we've integrated a lot of shopping capabilities directly into the content to enable creators that are creating things to also sell products. And we've uh, sort of been working with the folks at Pampered Chef for more than a year now. We've had, you know, probably well more than 5,000 Pampered Chef consultants create recipes on the Jump Rope app. And it's really great. It's been a great example for us of seeing how sort of motivated people looking to sell things can develop helpful content that helps them sell thousands of dollars worth of products. Fantastic. Hey, Brian, why don't I kick it off with a definition and you tell me if I'm right or wrong and we will go from there. So when when I hear social commerce, I think of the idea of using networking, networking websites like Facebook or, or Instagram um, as vehicles to promote and sell. The, I guess the key there is sell products and services. How, how close am I or, or what's a better? No, I think I think, Jeff, you are you are on the spot, right? Essentially, social commerce is an avenue of being able to perform and provide transaction or at least even like to a point where you can generate significant demand or interest for transaction or subscription related products in in your network the networks mean the networks could be anything right these days there are hundreds of different types of networks but there are the the big ones that are very uh, very popular the facebooks of the world the instagrams of the world and then they're not only just networks but also are ecosystems uh, that, that that have several networks underneath it. A classic example is the Facebook ecosystem, which actually has Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, all those things. Similar, similarly, you know, you have, you know, currently the, we are right now in one of those networks, which is the clubhouse ecosystem, a clubhouse network, and eventually that will become an ecosystem. So that, that's kind of the avenue of how transactions are made and, and uh, another point I also want to highlight, we'll go touch this a little bit deeply. Uh, when we talk about social commerce, it's not just about networks and ecosystems, but it's also about the outlets or the touch points. Right? You know, if you look at Facebook, you, know, you have the Facebook app on your device, but you can also have a search, Facebook Messenger, or you could have a filter on your search bar or on your SMS, which could be an Instagram filter or an Instagram uh, pop-up, right? So there are many, many touch points, the, the way 
with the, the way these networks are manifesting themselves today. So, so wherever social commerce can become, it can get broader and broader. Do you need to actually purchase in the, in the channel for it to be social commerce and not just social influence? Um, I, I have a broader definition. I feel like you don't need the transaction to happen, but, but, but the success of the success is creating the transaction. So where does social commerce sit? Is that from, from an analyst perspective, do I need to be creating a new channel? I mean, it's, it's not digital commerce, it's social commerce. Is there different revenue streams? How should we in the, in the, the analyst business be thinking about this? So, so if you think about the analyst world, I think social commerce is, is already a highly defined category today, right? So I think if you look at, you know, Grandview Research and a few other folks who, who have defined, who have basically come up with numbers in the in the in this space. So it's 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 a well defined category today. So now the question is, you know, what does all what does what are the elements that create the social commerce is still, you know, up for debate, right? Because everybody has a broad way of thinking about it. But overall, social commerce is a, a defined category. I'll just give you some high level numbers. In uh, twenty twenty, the social commerce market is estimated to be 474.8 billion. The numbers again, it's 474.8 billion, growing at a KGAR of 28 some percentage. If it keeps that growth, it'll go up to about 3.36 trillion by 2028. So, so it's a big growth. It, it, it already is way bigger than, I mean, we've been talking about KGARs and market sizes in the last, couple of sessions. It's way bigger than AI's current market size because it's already an established segment. So question, just to put this in context, right? If you look at retail today, on e-commerce market size uh, today is about $9 trillion. It's $9 trillion growing at about a 14.7% CAGR growth, especially with COVID and all that stuff. The, the market size for social is about 474, about 8% of the total commerce market, e-commerce market. Just a note on that. When Brian's talking about those numbers, he's referring to B2B and B2C. And that's a worldwide number. And that comes from a, a recent a Grandview research study. So a lot bigger number and a far bigger definition than, than what most of us in retail look at. So that explains why that number is a lot larger than, than a lot of us in classic retail really think. That Those are obviously massive, massive numbers. How how many retailers? And I always go to the the you know, the, the tier one retailers of of the five hundred or so plus tier one retailers. How many are actively engaged in social commerce today? Do you think? I think quite a few of them are already there, right? The, the bigger ones, the Alibaba, the Amazons of the world, they are they are already engaged in social commerce. Then, of course, you have the networks themselves are a big part of the social commerce. And in Asia, more and more of the retailers are much more deeply engaged in social commerce, right? Because also what's happening is that the social platforms are providing better capabilities and outlets. Like, you know, Facebook, you can create stores. Instagram, you can create uh, selling capabilities, carts, and all these things, right? WeChat has mini programs. So all these things are creating a, a better shopping avenues and kind of a touch point for all these players who are coming in. So that's enabling retailers to do commerce better because you don't have to build a lot of these pieces within, you know, within your ecosystem. All you have to do is upload your product feed and uh, press a few switches and you, you are online selling commerce, right? So one thing, Jeff, at this given point, right, I also like to highlight some of the views from Shiv here as well, because, you know, uh, what's really interesting, Shiv, why don't you give an introduction to your side of social selling? Because you have a very interesting take, right? Because if you look at, you know, the traditional social commerce is, you know, build a big network and, you know, you know, people will come. And then, of course, you know, so before social commerce takes over, most of it is monetized through advertising, but but you got you have a really interesting model where where you know you 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 take a a practice in real world where people have used interactive and direct type selling and you can and then you've translated that successfully in into commerce. Can you tell us a little bit about, about how you guys are doing and how you guys are thinking about it? 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Brian. I'm uh, happy to talk about it. You know, it's kind of an interesting perspective as I hear you and you know, and talk about the size of the market because it's a it's a really interesting question around what is the definition of social commerce. You know, and from our perspective, you know, the the most simplest definition is the idea that you're monetizing social behaviors. You're know, monetizing networks in a in a in a social framework versus a more formal framework. So, and you're leveraging kind of virality to to, to drive commerce. And if you think about the, think about social commerce around those lenses, our business has been doing that now forever. The direct selling business, the direct selling industry in general is about a $35 billion industry and, and still and growing and actually had slowed down for a while, but has actually accelerated ever since the, you know, the growth of a lot of these social networks. And essentially, because these social networks are enabling people to connect much faster. Pampered Chef ourselves as a company is in this space and has been around for 40 years. And essentially the business model is all around finding a, what, what we call consultants and nothing but individual, you know, individuals who are interested and have a passion for a product and, and want to talk about the product and want to talk about the, their passion, in which in our case, it's all around reinventing mealtime and, and all around cooking. And so the people who engage in our business are super interested in that passion, but then they want to find a way to monetize that passion, which they're effectively doing the things they would normally do, but they want to get paid for that passion. And, And the way they do that, and we basically create a model whereby they can monetize it. Now, for years and years and years, that was a very physical, interactive, experiential model. But what's what's happening now in terms of social commerce is, you know, in the last few years, we've seen a massive shift over to leveraging social, different social networks to engage in those activities. And what that what's done with that is it's taken a, it's taken their ability and it's amplified their voice because now they can connect with many more people faster, and they can. And we are seeing varied levels of performance from different people. So some people are being very successful. They're becoming micro-influencers and other people are being less successful. But the point is they're all converting and driving that behavior. So in some respects, I know, Brian, we've talked about this in the past. You know, I'm an ex, I, I, I've, I've been in the retail industry prior to Pampered Chef. I was at Sears and we would always joke about how Sears had a catalog and then Amazon really took the Sears catalog and digitized it and and made it more relevant for for today and in some respects social commerce i mean i kind of look at it in our industry it's the same thing is we've we've got a model for how we go to market in a in a with leveraging physical experiences and now you know we're digitizing that and and amplifying that and and and, and there's a race on to figure out who can do it in the best way and in the most frictionless way and that creates the maximum value for consumers and uh, entrepreneurs alike Perfect. Thank, thank you, Shiv. I think you know that's a that's a beautiful view on 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 how your business, how you see the commerce, social commerce side of the business. And uh, Shiv, that is sort of where you see it today. But where do you see it going? And how do you see like the traditional commerce networks, like you know Facebook, or so even like established networks, either playing into it or building upon it? How will how how does this how does this concept get into a different scale? Yeah, so I think I think first and foremost, I think there's a you know broad kind of uh, omni-channel view of this, which is that ultimately you know everybody needs to meet consumers where they are at, and everybody has their own preference uh, in terms of what social networks they subscribe to and what they utilize. And what we're starting to see is that the successful you know social commerce players are leveraging all the different social networks that are available. And on one side, and and finding essentially finding consumers where they're at. On the flip side of it, and this is where it gets really interesting, is what we're seeing is that these social commerce, uh, these social networks, are enabling social commerce to happen in a frictionless way. So, as an example, we are participating in a beta with Instagram, and Instagram has a their they are enabling Instagram checkout, which is essentially a way by which. You can uh, you can you can talk about products. You can talk about interesting things that you're, uh, you're you have passion for, and they're enabling you to check out directly from the Instagram feed in a frictionless one-click way. And then of, of course Instagram was looking to potentially monetize that. You know there are others who are looking to do the same thing. I know Jake's on the phone and he can talk about it. The 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 real value here ultimately I I'm, and Jake 
can definitely speak more to it is content has become king and and creating authentic content is the currency in which social commerce players are playing on, uh, with and then if you have authentic valued content it gives you a leg up in ability to drive higher conversion and then the players on the on the digital side are creating uh, avenues whereby you can create those conversions faster easier and in a more frictionless way i don't know jake if you want to talk about that a little bit yeah t- totally and i think that's that's very con- what you're seeing sort of at hamper chef is kind of i think very consistent with what we're seeing more broadly i i think it comes down to that when consumers go to make purchases especially purchases that are sort of on the more expensive side things that are not commodities things that are discretionary they they need trust right they need to know is this product good do i need it will i get value out of it and the people that you know consumers that any consumer trusts most for many purchases is like their close friends and family and the people who they sort of trust and follow and engage with around them and and i think what social commerce is doing is it's empowering those people and sort of pamper chap has been doing this as she said for 40 years first in people's living rooms and now in people's you know, Facebook group to enable those people who are passionate about a product to explain to other people why they should buy it. And and it's and it's all about and it's all about trust. I think the other thing, just going back to something that was mentioned a couple of minutes ago, is I actually think about thinking about social commerce as as like which of the biggest five hundred retailers are doing it isn't quite the right way to think about it. Because it's actually really enabling brands to go much more directly to consumers, right? And so uh, you're seeing a slew of you know brands emerge on platforms like Shopify, and instead of needing to go hustle to get bigger retail relationships, they're able to find a community of people that are passionate about their product, and those people can go out into their communities and sell those products. And I think if you talk to kind of the big CPG companies, what they're seeing and struggling with in a way is this sort of fragmentation towards all of these micro brands built for kind of niche communities. And all of a sudden, you don't need as much scale because you don't need to go through these big mega retailers to get your products to market in this sort of much more democratized social commerce. So if I'm a retailer, I'm looking at this as a threat then? I think if, if, you're, a re, if you're a traditional retailer, I think you are. Uh, well, again, this sort of diff, yeah, if you're a traditional retailer aggregating lots of brands, right? You, absolutely, this is, um, absolutely, this is a threat. I think if you think about it, you know, Instagram is trying to play the role that Target, Walmart, and Amazon do um, at the end of the day. Correct, correct. Yeah, but but also, Jake here, how does, what would be the best way for, what would be some of the approaches the retailers could take, right, to play in it, right? Because a lot of the things about disintermediation and disaggregation is, is also depends on the brand and the, there is always a choice, right? If the retailer had a choice, what would be the right action based on, you know, what your experience and what, what, what's your take on it? Yeah, and by the way, I'm by no means saying retailers are going away. Retailers can absolutely uh, continue to play. Retailers can continue to play, play in this game. Listen, I mean, I think retailers can take advantage of it the same way that brands can take advantage of it in terms of, you know, helping, you know, people on social platforms or those retailers themselves kind of promoting the products that are in that are in their shop. It's just one level more of abstraction away from the brand. But there, I, there's no reason why, you know, a retailer can't use all of the same practices to sell products that an individual brand can do. And, and again, I, I think what's, what's tricky and, you know, I think what, what Shiv and the Pampered Chef team have really hit on is this model of, you know, finding and training sort of consultants, which, you know, their consultants I see as kind of the original quote unquote influencers. I think what people have really struggled with in the social commerce game is like, how do I scale? This? I think that, that, you know, influencer marketing in this sort of traditional sense is hard to scale. It's very not performance based. Does this person really have 50,000 followers? Where are those followers? Who are those followers? And one of the reasons why Instagram's kind of made a big push into this game is they recognize that you know, there's all of this potential commerce happening on their platform, but like there's a kind of ton of friction, and it's really hard to attribute. You know, you know, influencer X is promoting product that how much of product Y was sold, and to whom. And I think what's what's happening, and certainly you know, Facebook slash Instagram's goal 
is to facilitate that and have brands and retailers be able to have sort of performance and analytics on top of that so they know who's actually selling that product. Because I think that that's very challenging and holding back the social commerce world today. Yeah, and I, I don't know, Jeff, I mean, like, even my perspective as well on it, it's interesting as you as you hear the conversation, it's like this Venn diagram between trust content and, and friction, making it easy. And I think if you can hit that midpoint where you can you can find what a consumer trusts. So I would say that trust is uh, trust is somewhat dependent, and on who you trust and how you trust is is a critical part of the currency, which is very much tied to the content and the information you're providing, and 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 how how valuable is it, how authentic is it, and how much do I believe it. And which is very much tied to how frictionless it is, because at the end of it, if you if you solve for the top two, but you can't solve for friction, then it it doesn't solve for it. I think where the three are coming together now is where is the interesting space. And I think to answer your question in just my perspective, I I, I don't I I do think that it's a different type of competition and a different world that retailers are going to play with. If I were a retailer, I'd certainly be looking at non-traditional people like. The Facebooks, the Instagrams, the you know Snapchats, TikToks as real threats and real retail, you know even jump rope. I mean they're all going to enable essentially they're all racing for the same thing. It's to create those direct relationships between brands and consumers. However, I don't think they own the trust space. I think there are other ways to build trust, other ways to create content that need that solves consumer needs. I think that's that it remains to be seen how this all shakes out. But I definitely think there's. This is uh, this is going to continue to grow, and I, I don't think that well, this is going to go away anytime soon. And we're seeing it in our businesses as as uh, as we digitize our business more. We figured out how to monetize it. We're we're seeing success. Yeah, and I think that trusting also really comes down to sort of the category that you're that you're talking about. You know, in, in shows business, other people who cook are very authentic in communicating. You know, what pops and pans. Uh, someone else might, might want to purchase. If you all of a sudden jump to, you know, a medical space, I don't think you necessarily want medical or even like, you know, dermatological or skincare advice from necessarily your next door neighbor. In that case, a sort of brand that has authority, right, a Sephora that kind of has authority as a retail brand for, you know, makeup, for example, may actually succeed by being helpful with great content, albeit, as we know, kind of, I think actually beauty is often the place if you're going to look for the tip of the spear of what's happening in social commerce. I think beauty is often the place to look where, you know, a ton of very powerful influencers have popped up and, and they've become exceptionally powerful in, in the beauty world over the past, over the past five years. Um, agree, agree, Jake. Yeah, because I think beauty is definitely one of those areas. I, I mean, we, we, we are seeing that as well because beauty is definitely a, one of those areas where it's highly demonstrable and then influencers can grab other, I mean, can capture other influencers and build strong networks. But one thing, Jake, I wanted to kind of, um, get your thoughts on is this on, on the stories, right? Story creation. Like if you look at like Instagram, I think there's like 500 million people. Their users every day interacting with Instagram stories. And then, you know, some of the avenues of how you build things and things like, you know, jump rope in terms of creating the guidebooks and a storytelling methodology. What is, I mean, how do you see that growing? Where do you, I mean, because that seems like this is the, this is the more engaging form of interaction. Tell us a story about how do you, you know, how do you came about doing this? And also, like, where do you see it going? What would be yeah. the next level of it? Be, be? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So I'll give you the way I think about stories as a format. And, and this is in part why we, the sort of stories are the foundation of the format sort of we built with Jump Rope. If you think about it, there's several sort of canonical formats of content in the world. Sort of the article or the, the you know, came about with the advent of sort of the printing press. And then the video, right, came about with the advent of the motion picture. And both of these formats that, you know, until a couple of years ago, and, you know, the photograph, obviously, too, these three formats of kind of like written word, you know, video, photo, really were the backbone of the Internet until several years ago. But none of them really take advantage of the concept of the fact that you now have something in your hand that you can both watch and touch at the same time. And, and so stories really is the, is the sort of next canonical format, as I see it, 
that takes advantage of the fact that we now have this thing that we can both watch and touch. And what it does is it enables you to have all of the power of words and videos on the screen, but you can all of a sudden make it exceptionally interactive. And it gives you as the user so much more control over what you're doing. You know, if you think about it, I sort of use the analogy of, right, there's no, if you want to watch a five minute video cut into a bunch of segments on stories, you can just sit there and let the story play. So there's Correct. no downside versus, you know, watching video in the traditional sense. But all of a sudden, if you're like, you know what, I'm not that interested in this beginning. I, you know, of a, let's, say, let's say it's a five minute recipe. You know, like I know how to do this prep work. I'm really most curious about like the middle step. You just tap, 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 get to the middle of it and can really focus and engage with the part you're most interested in, et cetera. And then to sort of go to commerce, right? The thing of an MP4 file is ubiquitous in the world, but it's actually not interactive. There's no link in a video. It's just not part of that file format. And so if you see something that you want to learn more about in a video, your best bet is to, on YouTube, go check the description box below. As many people say on YouTube, go Google it, whatever. But there's no way to just tap on it and, and experience it. Whereas, at least in Jump Rope and a lot of kind of the evolved stories formats and Instagram does this with this sort of coordinate plane on top of the videos, it enables you to then go deeper and learn more about a person, a place, a thing. And that interactivity is driving a bunch of commerce, right? You see an amazing blender in a recipe that a Pampered Chef consultant posts, and you can go tap on that. You can go to the other recipes that use that blender. You can understand how much it costs, what are the specifications, how long it's going to take to get, and ultimately, you know, put in your credit card and check out. So I think, you know, just going back, stories are, they're more interactive, you know, regardless of what content, almost any content format you're, you're looking at because it gives you the ability to skip ahead and move at your own pace. And they enable all of these rich interactions, which is, of course, enabling all the shopping. And then lastly, which is super important of what we've built on Jump Rope and why, as you said, you know, there's all these people creating them on Instagram, is the, the nature of them has lowered the barriers to creation because the structure and simplicity of them, at least on, in a lot of formats, including on Jump Rope, have made it much easier for people to create engaging content in a stories format relative especially to a traditional video editing software. So that was a mouthful, but that's my tips on stories. No, that's very interesting because I think this whole creator economy, this creators, is sort of the renaissance of creators, right? We are in this renaissance of creators because um, that, you know, your point actually kind of provoked a lot of interesting thoughts in my head. And one one of the questions that arise from, from, from your statement is that what does the next gen look like? Where do you see things like, you know, voice? I mean, here we are in Clubhouse, right? Yep. What is the story equivalent of, of voice? And what is the story equivalent of AR, VR? And, and then maybe something that I've, I'm, I'm not even touching on. Where do you see this evolving? Where do you see this, 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 this going? Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't view I'm, I'm, I don't view I'm in sort of an expert on voice. I think why voice has become a thing is the same reason it's lowering the barrier to creation. I'm sitting here, you know, walking around my backyard right now instead of having to like be in a nicely lit place with Zoom on Zoom with all of you. Absolutely, right? yeah. That lowers <laughs> in a way, it's removing lowers, friction, it's, right? It's yeah, lower, it's lowering the barrier to creation in the same way that mm -hmm. I think going from traditional to video to stories has done it. So I think that's. That's really what sort of propelled, I think, propelled voice. I don't, I don't know. I think to me, AR and VR, I think AR and VR are very different. I think AR is really, you're going to see that being a layer on top of a lot of things, probably not voice. But I think one, one thing I think that is, is really interesting in terms of where the content ecosystem is going and the creator economy is I think you're, see, you're going to end up seeing what I sort of call this barbell effect around the content ecosystem. And you're going to have these, on one hand, big authoritative content companies like a New York Times, a Netflix, a Wall Street Journal that sort of win at big scale making, you know, really authoritative, incredible content. And then you're going to have basically on the other side, these platforms, whether they're Jump Rope, Clubhouse, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, empowering anyone who has knowledge, passion, creativity to become a star to sell products, et cetera. And I think you don't want to be in the middle. 
because you don't want to be sort of a, a company that's kind of in the middle. And I think you're seeing, you know, uh, unfortunately, the death of or, or decline of a lot of kind of traditional media companies that kind of fall in that middle space. They aren't the New York Times and Netflix of the world, and they aren't the platforms enabling creators with much lower cost structures and, you know, from their own kitchens to do it. So that's, that's just one thing I, I think a lot about, about where the content ecosystem is going. And I think if I was, a, you know, a retailer thinking about or where I was going to place my bets over the next five years in terms of marketing and reaching customers, I would probably think about that, that barbell effect. No, perfect. Perfect, Jake. Thank you. I think those are like very, very uh, deep views. And I love the way, you know, how, how, how you are thinking about it. This is going to be evolving. You know, touching a little bit on, on video and commerce. Shiv, you've done experiments on, on commerce uh, and video and as well as a little bit on VR, AR, VR type concepts. Can you tell us a little bit about how you see it and how do you see new forms of content evolving uh, with your business and how you are thinking about it? Yeah, so I think it's it's really interesting. So I think we know that when uh, video is done right, and it has a definite higher degree of conversion. So I think video creates believability and trust a lot more than the written word from our experience. I think the hard part with video is it's on both sides, but it's both the supply and demand side. On the supply side, it is the willingness and the comfort level for people to actually be able to either do video and video. When I talk video, I talk about video in two ways. One is video, which is video conferencing, where there's actually engagement, the two-way engagement. And then there is just a single-way video, which is you know more like the Facebook Live or YouTube or what have you. And I think in the, uh, on the, on the, the two-way engagement, I, I would say, you know, certainly the pandemic has helped us and that has become more of a use case than it was in the past. I wouldn't say it has, it has, it, it's hit the tipping point yet where it's become the predominant way people can drive commerce. I think there's also a little bit of a downside where it feels even more like a selling experience, which is, which is the, which, which actually doesn't help you. You almost want it to be a lot more authentic in, in, a, in a real social commerce world. I would say the one-way video has taken off, and when it's done right, it, it, it definitely drives conversion. We've seen it. The, the, the challenge has been the, the barrier to entry, and I think this is, I think, Jake, uh, the way Jake, you framed it, it makes a lot of sense, is it's that, it's that comfort level of going on video and people feeling comfortable. And actually, that's uh, a big space for somebody like a jump rope playing because it actually lowers that barrier to say you can now create video that is engaging and interesting and, and not have to be an expert in being able to do it. There are entire platforms around the ability to create videos in a in a very simplified way. And, and, and uh, you know, even an amateur can do it. And and irrespective of your comfort with with technology or your willingness to go in front of a camera. So the simple answer, I think video is great. I think that's why even things like Clubhouse is going to be super interesting just because of, again, that reduction in the barriers. As far as AR and VR is concerned, Brian, I think we have, we've just started to make a foray, specifically on the VR side. I would say I, it remains to be seen. The, the, general, the general learnings we're seeing with uh, VR is, it's a little bit like jewelry to begin with, where it drives a lot of interest and people are immediately engaged and want to uh, participate in it. But in terms of does it truly drive conversion, I, it, the, the jury's still out on it. And wh whether that is whether that is a fa whether that's a comment on the technology or whether it's a comment on where we are in the utilization of the technology, I, I, I don't know. If I if I were making a bet, I would say. It's probably that we haven't hit the tipping point in terms of how we can utilize the technology in a way that actually creates conversion. I don't think we've, we've figured that out yet, but it's, I would say that given the enthusiasm and given the, all the abilities and all the value it creates, uh, it's just like a case of a matter of time and cost. And as, as we figured those pieces out better, I mean, even now creating VR experiences is, you know, unlike, Unlike a video with you, where you can go and download a jump rope and create how-to videos pretty much for free, you know, with VR, it's it's a it's a costly it's a costly exercise to do it and to do it at scale. I think as, as I think as that becomes faster, I think we're going to see more innovation and more utility. So 
Uh, from our perspective, we believe in it. We're going to continue testing it to figure it out as the next barrier. But I would say it's, we're probably still a little bit of time. And I, I think just I think on the AR front, I think the most common uses of AR are actually a lot of them come down to kind of making people more comfortable and empowering creators. If you think about it, you know, all of the filters people are putting, you know, on their faces on Instagram when they go live on camera, that might be one of the most ubiquitous ubiquitous uses of AR and it's to make people feel more comfortable going on camera. I think we are going to see a bunch of it as I think about it in terms of in terms of shopping and commerce. I think that there's, you know, we know and we've fooled around with this a little bit on Jumper, but we know even if a creator doesn't tag a product in a step of a jump rope, we can use machine learning to, to figure out that, yes, that's actually a blender. Then we can sort of enable all sorts of experiences kind of on, on top of that, potentially while that person is creating, et cetera. So I think actually you are going to see these not revolutionary, but kind of subtle, you know, inroads of AR into sort of social commerce and this creator ecosystem, and you're, you're already seeing that. Perfect. Perfect, guys. Because I think it's really interesting because yesterday I was listening to a, a clubhouse and it was about, you know, how do we learn the human signals better, right? These implicit, implicit signals versus explicit signals from the brain. Products like, you know, in the future, things like Neuralink and other type of products would capture, capture, you know, would capture thoughts better. But in the meantime, people's actions are captured through these yeah, this, 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 this implicit capabilities, like, you know, what they, what they are interacting with and so on. So, you know, uh, what, on that thread, I have a quick question is that, you know, like, uh, I read somewhere that says that there is research that shows that 54% of people who are, sh- who are social shoppers, they make their, they do all their research and also make purchases on the medium they do the research in, right? Predominantly, there was always this comparison between Google and Facebook. People always said Google is a, a demand fulfiller, while Facebook is just a demand generator. Do you see that, uh, based on your experience, guys, or even anybody here in the audience, do you guys see that changing, shifting? This, this was this was said a couple of years ago, right? Uh, where, where you know, if you, if you know exactly what product to buy, you're going to Google and you're searching, and Google is just fulfilling your demand compared to you know Facebook is sort of creating the demand, right? Do you guys see that equation shifting or, or, the, or the same thing playing out? What's your thoughts on yeah. that? I can, I can jump on that for a second. I think that there, obviously, that is still 99% true. But if you look at the moves that Google and Facebook are making respectively, I think they both realize they have to go towards each other to continue to grow at the pace they want to. I don't. This was somewhat subtle, but sort of Instagram launched inability to actually search on Instagram for something that is not just a hashtag. And again, it's still early. It's still rudimentary. But interestingly, and, and the Google folks know this, is that they're starting to lose share of search to Instagram. Right? Like when I think about, hear about a person or a product or even a place, uh, five years ago, I certainly would have searched on Google. And now I'm actually more likely to search on Instagram. And similarly, in the other direction, You're seeing Google do a bunch of things specifically on a surface area called Discover that has, you know, isn't very known, but it has more than a billion daily active users just because of the ubiquity, how largely the Android platform. They're starting to sort of get into more of kind of a feed-based model, pushing you content based on your interests. They've actually built a stories format that's showing up there, but it's more, it's much broader than that. So I think you're going to see, I think you are seeing in subtle ways, the two pl- the two mega platforms sort of start to come at each other, but it's certainly going to take a while for that to play out. Interesting. Or, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Jake. Do you, who are your who are your competitors? Do you see Clubhouse as a competitor to you, or, or an enabler of what you want to do, or or any of the other platforms? I, I would certainly not say Clubhouse is a, is a competitor, and actually, right now, it's been an interesting enabler because we've created. It's actually been a great way, right? We need to sort of inspire creators and get creators together in communities. And Jump Rope isn't always the app itself isn't always the best way to foster those communities. And we've actually had a lot of success building creator community actually on Clubhouse. I certainly don't see Clubhouse 
as a competitor. I, you know, I think I think the the people I see we're competing most with are actually largely those in the middle of my barbell traditional media companies. I, I see us as we're empowering people from kind of their kitchens, their bathrooms, their gyms, garages to create content that is as good and often more authentic than what you know Condé Nast, Meredith, Hearst, right? The big traditional lifestyle publishers are producing with much higher cost structures in studios and, you know, expensive places in New York City otherwise. So I actually see those publishers as our competitors and then to some extent the other platforms of, you know, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Pinterest. Yeah, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I, find, yeah. yeah I found so many, uh, well, very much appreciate the discussion and, and thank you very much for all the all the different uh, points of view. A, a couple of questions. You opened the, the conversation with a, a number of interesting stats about the growth of social commerce. I was wondering if you could uh, maybe comment a little bit of how much of that is net new to retail versus a conversion uh, of traditional retail. How much of, you know, you, you had some dialogue also about the brick and mortars response to social commerce and the like. How much of, of this is going to be pulling uh, or expected to pull from the brick and mortar side of the business or the industry? I'll take that, but I, I'll also, that's a great question, Tim. I'll take that, but I'll also have other people, if any of the guys have a comment, feel free to jump in. But I think at a at a higher level that if you look at it, today it's about social commerce is about 8% of e-commerce uh, uh, market size in total, right? That's, that's basically 474.8 billion in 2020 compared to 9.98 billion, 8 billion uh, e-commerce market. What interesting is most of, most of it is created by the newer platforms, right? What I mean by that is it's created by platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and all the other platforms. So, so traditional retail's role in this is actually very small. This is think of this as actually the pie growing opposed to the pie shifting. Yeah, I would. This is Shiv. I mean, again, experience of one and in one retail in one industry, and we've definitely seen our growth has led to the pie growing. In fact, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about competitors in the same, you know, normal way uh, that you look at. We don't necessarily spend a lot of time talk about, talking about market share and who are we uh, stealing market share from because most of the growth is coming from net new. And, and I think part of the reason is because of the, the how, the, how the, the, the conversion is taking place. And it's, it's most of the time that conversion is taking place you know, there there are some cases where somebody's looking for something and 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 they happen to come across one of these experiences and end up buying. But for the most part, oftentimes it's it's a, you see somebody partaking in a behavior, and it it makes you either realize that there's an easier way or a faster way or a better way of doing something that you may not have thought about otherwise. And as a result, you're like, you know what, that looks really interesting. I see how you're doing it. You build trust, and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead. I this is here is somebody who's this like me phenomena, this here I'm seeing somebody who's like me do a behavior which which makes their lives better, easier, or faster, and I want to do that. And as a result, I end up making a purchase which I might not have normally done, which is very different than getting in with a specific, with, uh, you know, with a predetermined uh, notion of uh, being in the shopping space and then buying and, and partaking in this experience. So I, I, if I were to hazard a guess, I'd say, Majority of ours is net new. You know, that's actually at least my next question because, you know, when we think about social commerce, th- 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 those are two ideas that I think are somewhat mutually exclusive, right? I mean, social is about genuine, authentic relationships. Commerce is about selling stuff. And so when I put the two together, you know, do I not start to compromise the integrity of that authentic relationship with the idea that, hey, someone's trying to sell me stuff? I-, I-, I was wondering if you could comment too, do you see any kind of maybe natural limits? to the organic growth of social commerce. I mean, is this this is really interesting right now because we're in the early phases of it. But how do we think about the maturity of this market when people start to realize kind of like the the robocalls that we get continuously that it's just, you know, somebody trying to sell me something. Yeah, I think I think that I'll, I'll push back on that a little. I think what we've seen I, I don't think that's I'll put this right. I don't think that's going to limit the upside of social commerce. I think what we've seen and this is sort of played out out over the last couple of years is this concept of, you know, these Instagram influencers 
talking people, you know, deodorant one day, skincare products the other day, a baby stroller the next day, and, you know, 77% of their posts are hawking a product. Yeah, I think people are like, okay, I'm skeptical of this. I don't think you actually like all this stuff. So I think the people who were excessively opportunistic about it certainly lost lost authenticity. But I think, you know, even if I think about my own behavior as a consumer, I want to know what interesting things my friends are using and buying and doing that I get value out of. I think the reason why people show up at a at a, right, people show up at a store, right? I, I've sort of heard this about Costco. People show up at Costco to some extent to buy the, you know, toilet paper and, you know, you know, other staples that they need. But actually Costco, if you've noticed, if you go in, they actually rotate a percentage of the product frequently because that actually concept of the treasure hunt makes consumers come in and actually want to come back, want to come back to Costco because they're looking for cool new things. And so I think consumers are always... You know, especially those with some discretionary income are looking for cool new things and experiences. And to think about, you know, Shiv's product, right? I think a lot of them are are things I don't necessarily need, but it's going to make my life better. It's going to help me cook better food more efficiently for my family. Consumers are looking for these things, and it doesn't mean just because an influencer is talking about it or a pamper chef consultant is talking about it that feels excessively salesy. Yeah, and I'll jump in on that too, uh, Tim. I I think without a doubt, commerce is by definition social. I'm looking at my desk and literally thousands of dollars worth of equipment, 100% of it came from from recommendations, 100%. Some of it, about half of it's from here on Clubhouse. And so I think I think back of of every retail experience I've had going back to my father's meat shop and, and it's all social. I mean, it is. Now, I think that the, the word that um, I really picked up on, which I was sitting there just thinking and Jake nailed it, was authenticity. So, you know, that's to me the big deal. I could care less what somebody that's getting $100,000 for a Instagram post says, and now I'm also 61, so I'm not the target market for that. But if somebody that I trust says something, I'm absolutely going to be influenced by that. And that's because they are authentic and they actually maybe use the product. So that's how I'd, I'd that's how I'd see it shake out. Yeah, and Jeff, I, I would I would uh, agree. I mean, we've got actual user data in terms of our sellers. I mean, we have thousands of sellers, and we see it all the time. the The ones who are successful, authentic, use the product, and can speak from a position of uh, both passion as well as trust. And I think those are the people who are successful, and they 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 generate their networks, grow their networks, and. And, uh, and create a following. The, the people who are just trying to uh, to drive sales and find the fastest way to uh, to make a buck are not successful. And uh, I think it's it's the same thing. It's that the, the the best thing we can do in the social commerce, which is full circle, why content is so important, is 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 creating authentic content that that people actually care about. Very interesting. Hey, thank you, guys. This yeah. was very helpful. Appreciate it, Tim. Yeah, you know that. Perfect. Thank shit. you, Tim. Yeah. And uh, question, Ravi, you did you have any comments or any any thoughts? Joined as a speaker as well. So, team, you know, I like to I like to welcome Ravi here. Ravi, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell us your views? Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me up here, Brian. A really interesting discussion. I I'm, I'm a, I host a uh, podcast called the Disruptors Podcast, and my company is called the it's called Bluemax. We're a technology scout for corporate partnerships. We work with the really early stage companies and help them develop industrial partnerships. And what I'm really interested in about is uh, social commerce in the B2B space, one. And also, two, uh, you know, we kind of talk about like the human to human connection here in social commerce, but I want to talk about the machine to machine connection as well. So, in the first step is going back to number one, right? Like, what I'm tracking is the evolution of businesses, like how they can better hyper-personalize with their audiences and, and, and talk to them, one through voice, the voice platform. But two, also what's happening with uh, B2B is like there's, there's tons of all these tiny, tiny companies developing and interacting with each other. And one of the mechanisms that are doing that is uh, podcasting or creating shared media. There's, there's been a development of like a type of podcasting called client-based podcasts. You know, there's 1.1 million podcasters, I think 1.3 now million in North America alone, and only about 100,000, less than 1%, have an audience-dependent audience, uh, audience platform, meaning the audience is large enough that they can, get, they can monetize from the audience just purely. Everything else is the secondary or tertiary to an existing business. 
And what I think in the B2B space, a lot of small businesses are using is using the power of social, using the power of producing media to not just you know buy a building and develop an audience, but talk to their prospects together on air or through a vehicle and build relationships by developing shared media. No, Ravi, those are great points, Ravi. So, Ravi, this is interesting because this sort of touches on the conversation that Jeff and I had at Mama Mia. Remember, Jeff, <laughs> about where where would retailers take retailers and brands? How can they leverage Clubhouse once Clubhouse starts opening up, right? The APIs and integration, even this might be interesting for you know larger for other larger platforms as well. So, Ravi, where do you see larger brands and retailers on the same vein? You kind of give a small business yeah. usage, right? How does so, how does a larger brand take advantage of it? So, Microsoft's recent acquisition, Discord, might make it the most valuable brand in the world. So, Microsoft right now has the most valuable set of B two B SaaS products, B two SaaS products in the market with LinkedIn and everything. Yeah. Exactly. But with the acquisition of uh, Discord, it's going to put them uh, into uh, B2C market space, right? Uh, through the, through uh, Discord's huge uh, discovery, the huge uh, community building platform and, you know, its gaming community. So they're going to see a vertical integration of uh, communities and its gaming platforms and go direct to consumer with a whole set uh, suite of services through Discord. Uh, and it could completely, uh, you know, radically change the whole arm of their business. So I, I definitely see that as a large part of this, the thing of this. Oh, perfect. Okay, so you see that, you know, larger platforms like Microsoft sort of leading the way and then kind of others adding into it. And then retailers and brands, the, they create a platform so other brands could participate on it. Okay, so I think, no, I, I, I definitely agree. Um, I definitely agree that that, that area is going to, that, that's an untapped area, right, that can that has the yeah. possibility to blossom. So I have, sorry, so go sorry, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just had two points. So the second point I want to bring also is the communication of machine-to-machine communication. So communities that are being built on. So Discord, for example, there's NFT community being built on top of it, where if you own a fraction of a certain particular NFT, then you can be automatically allowed in certain Discord communities. And they're building communities around part things that you own. So the depth of this of the strategy is, is becoming more and more utilized as there's machines to machine communication as well on top of these platforms that are automatically authenticating people into communities. Perfect, perfect. So that's creating, that also could create additional growth as well, right? Yeah, perfect. Jeff, do you want to open up for any any more questions and any any thoughts for the team? Uh, yeah, sounds good. So we're going to go probably about another four or five minutes. So if anybody has any questions, raise their hands. As I look at this as an analyst and as a as a you know, person that talks to an awful lot of retailers and, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm probably... I'm intrigued as an analyst because of the revenue streams and the, and the opportunities. I'm very intrigued because, you know, I'm on Clubhouse, so I can see I can see this whole creator community evolving across all kinds of platforms, and I'm probably pretty nervous if I'm a retailer. So what, you know, how do I do, how do I create this? Other than Ulta and Sephora, which I would agree, as somebody that really has no zero expertise in the beauty industry other than paying for a teenage daughter for all those years, it just seems that there's so much innovation that's come out of those two those two retailers and it makes perfect sense that they would be driving the innovator, driving the influencer market, which is probably a model, I guess, for the rest of, of retail to look at what those two folks are doing and try to figure out if is there some kind of an angle for them. Outside of that, I have to be very concerned about the the movement of the brands into what used to be their space. I mean, it's 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 logical. It's 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 happening. There's no there's no doubt about it. But how do I defend against it? And it's going to be interesting to watch that play out. Hey, um, just uh, I was wondering if you could ask uh, maybe comment. Uh when you look at social commerce from a global perspective in, in retail, do you see a difference in other countries? It seems like, you know, when I was at NRF earlier this last year, that there was some really interesting work that was being done in Central America, some of the South American countries, the Central, Central American, uh, and even Brazil too as well. But I don't see as much of the big retailers, clothing retailers, kind of embracing the, the social commerce here in the States. Uh, I mean, no, I, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sure. No, the one thing I could talk about is, I mean, it depends on how you how you view them, but you know, some of the things I mean, I, you know, speaking of just you know, looking at some of the trends coming out of China, especially, it's very interesting because I think they, in many respects, are on on the forefront of it, both on video platforms that they have, you know, web e-commerce websites like Pinduoduo and the things they're doing in terms of enabling, you know, commerce through things like WeChat. I know in India, there's some interesting people that are working in this space. So I, I, I am seeing 
it growing, in fact, more rapidly in some of those other countries. And we're actually drawing a lot of inspiration from there and, and, and trying to model ourselves around that. Yeah, I, I, I would say China is, if you're looking for inspiration, China is the clear place to look. Oh, that's, that's helpful. And then one other quick question, if you don't mind. Are there any particular categories of retail that seem to lend themselves very well to uh, more so than others to social commerce? I think uh, I mean, primary, yeah, go ahead. You got gotcha. Yeah, I think it's primarily there are a couple of categories. There is actually even a, a graph on it. I'll put uh, it from uh, grandviewresearch.com. Beauty is personal and beauty care is a top, followed by apparel, followed by accessory, and then home products. So that's yeah. kind of the uh, high-level yeah. categories, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think if you look at sort of why it's those categories and you want the sort of why behind it, it's, it's sort of discretionary, right? It's, it's things that people don't need that are at a low to moderate price point. And I think, you know, Shiv's stuff, you know, Shiv's products, the temper stuff fall in there. I think that those are the things that tend to lend themselves best to... Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I have another question. And of course, you know, if anybody else wants to, you know, go ahead, feel free to jump in and raise, or raise your hand and we'll put you in. But I have a quick question. Probably Ravi, Jake, or even Shiv can take it. Uh, so, see, one of the things in, in social commerce, in, 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 in the story format, you know, the conversion process is somewhat easy in terms of having a button that says, you know, buy now or learn more or something, right? But in the, in the newer formats like voice, it gets a little bit more complicated, right? How do you convert them? What are some of the, as you are thinking about these newer formats and the world is evolving, Jake, Ravi, and uh, you guys, how do you see the, the, the frictions there and how would you remove those frictions? Yeah, listen, I, I think one of the things holding this back is that there is a lot of friction, is that the, the, that the social platforms did not start as commerce platforms, at least in, at least in the U.S. I think that if I look to sort of, you know, what Instagram shopping is doing as, I think, the sort of clear, like, beacon and inspiration, it's going to take them a while to get there. But, right, they are doing a lot of things to enable people to check out on Instagram. They're doing that by you know, working with folks like Shopify. So, you know, doing those integrations and they're doing integrations with one-off brands that are powerful and influential uh, to enable to reduce that friction sort of on, on the Instagram platform. And that's, if you think about it, Amazon is not social shopping, but what they did is, right, they, I prefer to buy things on Amazon because I don't have to enter my credit card again. I don't have to give them my shipping address again. I just know it's going to work. So I think we're still a long way from kind of, reducing sort of all of that friction. I know TikTok is, you know, going to launch something that looks a lot like Instagram shopping in some ways where, you know, you can buy directly on TikTok. So I think, I actually think this friction is holding back. And even, even Shiv and I were talking about this last week with something we're working on together. This friction is holding back social commerce. And I think it's going to take a year or two for the social platforms to build these integrations and reduce the friction but it's absolutely coming. And it's, you know, if you go to Google, shopping is one of the top priorities. You go to Facebook, Instagram, shopping is one of the top priorities. So this is coming. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For more info, refer to the pod notes below. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us grow. I'm your host, Jeff Roster, analyst at large. If you want to connect, follow us on Twitter at Jeff PR or at Brian South Nation, or connect with us on LinkedIn. Visit my website at roster.retail.com or brian's at iterate.ai. Until next time, stay safe and have a great week. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For more info, refer to the pod notes below. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us grow. I'm your host, Jeff Roster, analyst at large. If you want to connect, follow us on Twitter at Jeff PR or at Brian South Nation, or connect with us on LinkedIn. Visit my website at roster.retail.com or brian's at iterate.ai. Until next time, stay safe and have a great week.